and he turned them over and he, he ran them all out. And you know, the Pharisees had a, a way of always wanting to know where Jesus got his authority. And you know, Jesus was in heaven with God the Father, and he was equal with God the Father, but he left that authority in heaven, and he came as a man. Y'all come on in. He came as a, as a sinless man, but he came as a man. And he had to depend on the Holy Spirit. But when he, when he chased out all the money changers, he said, it is said that my house, talking about the temple, talking about God's house, shall be a house of prayer. Where did he get that? He got that from Isaiah 56. And he quoted Isaiah 56. And that was his authority. The word of God was his authority. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And we've dedicated this place as a house of prayer. And we have that same authority to cast out anything, any resistance... And anybody that comes in here and doesn't want to receive the gospel, they came in for whatever reason, as a friend of somebody, as a favor to somebody, well, I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to fold my arms and I'm not going to receive. Well, we cast that out. We have authority over that. We come against that. You in my house now, says the Lord. Like those football players. You in my house. You're not going to do that in my house. Not in my house. Well, we're going to tell the devil, you're not going to do that in my house. Hallelujah. If that makes you uncomfortable, better find out who's your daddy. I'm going to leave you some time, Rose. I'm just warming up the crowd for you. I'm warming them up. Hallelujah, Rose is full of the Holy Ghost today and she's going to let it go. All right, this is Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, and I want to read that. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I, I being God, have appointed watchmen all day and all night. They will never keep silent. You who remain, you who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves, verse 7, and give him, give God no rest until he establishes Jerusalem a praise on the earth. Do you know that scripture is being uh, fulfilled as we speak right now? As we speak right now, in Jerusalem, in, in June 1967, they took back the city of Jerusalem. And since June of 1967, almost 50 years, June 2017 will be 50, 50 years, day and night, 24 hours a day, at the Wailing Wall, at the Western Wall, Jews have been praying day and night since 1967. They are giving God no rest Amen. until He fulfills that scripture, and He's fulfilling it through the Jews right now and through Christians right now who reach out in prayer and touch the hem of Jesus' garment, touch the face of God. With your prayers. God says, give me no rest. Continue to pray until I make Jerusalem the praise of the earth. You know when that's going to happen? When Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, comes and sits on the throne. Guess where? In New York City? In Los Angeles? In Paris? No, in Jerusalem on the throne of David, and then Jerusalem will be the praise of the earth. 
You can have a part in it by giving God no rest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, for your visitors today, we're, we're staying calm. We're staying calm. We don't want to act up because we don't want to offend y'all. But come back sometime and get to be a uh, part of the group, and we'll really go wild. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I think Rick has something, too. Hey, Rick, what you got, Rick? Yeah. <laughs> Very brief. While we were singing the song, something came to me. You know, I've been here 26 years in this fellowship, and I'm looking around, and every one of us has, has had a time where we dip, a time of suffering, sickness, death, job loss, every one of us. And then, you know, you go to God, of course, but who do you have in, in between you and God? you got your pastor and his wife. Amen. And it's that time of year again where we express our appreciation to the pastor and his wife. If the two of you could come up here, please. You, sir. And, you know, God was concerned one day because Adam didn't have anybody. There was no good enough looking orangutans or anything like that. So he had to create something. And this is who he created for you. And, and we, you know, we appreciate everybody in here. You appreciate everybody in here. But this is our time to say that we appreciate you. Amen. And I think I've got a dollar here in my wallet somewhere. <laughs> oh, here it is. My name's Jimmy. I'll take all you give me. <laughs> Will you take this? That's $500 bills right there. And after you've gotten the, the grandkids taken care of and got the new dress purchased, then there's a card in there that you can read how much everybody appreciates you. <laughs> because in our hearts, we really do. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. And and I know him. I know him. And I know her. See, I'm standing up here next to him. I'm trying to get some points here, but whatever. But anyway, we appreciate the two of you. We appreciate all you've done. I know I called you at 2 o'clock in the morning one day, and you came right down there because uh, we had a hurt. We had a time. And everybody in here, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody's had that time. And they're here as God's servants to step in and, and have a human being touch. And, you know, when Susan, you know, when you get around her, she's going to put good words on you. Pastor Bob's going to put the word on you. Susan's going to pray for you. And then she's going to keep on praying for you. And then keep praying for you. And then you're going to feel comforted. But we appreciate you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, darling. We always like to give God the glory. Amen. To God be the glory. To God. Be the glory to God, be the glory for the things you have done with your blood, you have saved us by your power. You have raised us to God, be the glory for all the things you have done. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. I would sing, but I'm going to give you all a break. <laughs> uh, oh, you don't think I can sing? Huh? <laughs> John, we love you and Hattie. Hattie, we love you back there. God bless both of you. We love you so much. 
I, th I think that was the quickest turnaround I've ever had. I gave the young lady $20 and I got 500 back. That's not too bad. <laughs> okay, uh, Linda, come up and share with us. <laughs> Good morning. Um, we had a big crowd in Sunday school today, but for those of you who were not there, um, Leah's bridal shower is next Sunday at 9 o'clock. Please be here early so we can get started, and we're going to have a huge crowd of people, and we want to give her time to honor her. Um, if you have the veil you wore when you got married, please wear it next Sunday. If you do not have a veil and prefer to bring a picture, that would be fine too. But I thought it would be kind of fun for her to see the different styles that we wore throughout the ages. <laughs> I, think, I, I think I threw my veil away. Oh, oh you meant, oh, 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 the girls, oh, okay. How do, okay, we're going to go for this thing. We want uh, Rose to have... Uh, plenty of time to share the Word of God. We're so fortunate here at the Shield of Faith to have men and women of God that can share the Word of God. Each one has their unique way. The Holy Spirit weaves it into their life to share with us. And all of it makes the, the overall God just showing us all the different aspects of His beauty, His love, uh, His Word. And I appreciate every um, minister, and every teacher, and everyone here at the Shield. So Rose, come up. We love you, Rose William, a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give her our attention. Amen. Woo! I'm at home now. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just want to praise God this morning for all he has done and for who he is and what he is still yet getting ready to do in our lives. I'm overjoyed this morning, I really am. I, um, I'm almost a loss at words, and for a big mouth like me, that's hard. <laughs> but I have such a wonderful miracle in the house with me this morning. Pastor, that's my granddaughter in the back. Would you stand, baby? I, uh, that's a little part of Rose in the back. And I'm so grateful to God uh, for her being here with me today. This is the first time she would hear Nana speak or anything. And I'm just grateful that I didn't ask her to come. She asked me. And she said, Nana, you think I could bring William? I said, you certainly can. And so for young people to want to come to the house of the Lord, you know, it's, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, not to be before you uh, too long this morning, I'm running, believe me, on hardly no sleep for weeks now. Really weeks, maybe two hours. Two and a half, three, and I'm just standing on God's grace this morning, but I praise him, I do. We give praises to your name, oh God, praises to your name, oh God. 
For your name is great, sing it, and greatly to be praised. We give praises to your name, oh God. Praises to your name, oh God. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. I just praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Yes, I do. And without any furtherance, I'd like to draw your attention to the Old Testament, to the book of Judges. And maybe later on this week, if you have some time, because the book of Judges is about 21 chapters. But I have been fixed and my heart has been fixed these last couple of days on just one scripture, one verse. The book of Judges, chapter 8. And I have one verse for you this morning, verse 4. And I'm going to be reading to you out of the New King James Version. And I know they're going to put it on the screen shortly, but I'm going to read it to you. And it reads as thus, Judges 8 and 4. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit, exhausted, but still in pursuit. Would anybody in here know what that feels like? Exhausted. Exhausted from this fight of faith. Exhausted from wrestling with the flesh and wrestling with the devil. Seeking God's face. Putting up with life and sickness and finances and disappointments. And you name it. And we could go on. And after a while, you can just be flat mentally and physically exhausted. But it's a wonderful and it's an amazing thing. How in spite of all of that we sometimes must go through. I think about my own self. We just get up again and do it all over again. We keep on pursuing, exhausted, but still in pursuit. And, you know, that's not us. But it is the power of the Holy Spirit that works on the inside of us that helps us to do far more than we ever dared or thought. It's God's Spirit. It's His grace the reason some of us are still standing. You know, I'm so glad that God does not see us as we sometimes may see ourselves. Sometimes because of our circumstances, we are hard pressed on ourselves. And I'm hard pressed on myself, yes I am. And in our inability to properly Assess who we are now in Christ Jesus. You know, we all have a tendency sometimes to think how incapable and how unworthy we all are to do anything for God. But God saw something in every last one of us in here this morning that he thought was worth dying for. Not a person in here is an accident. Not a per person in here. God did not give a purpose. 
He said he even knew us before we were in our mother's womb. And before we came out of the womb, he consecrated us for such a time as this. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about Gideon. I need to lay a little bit of foundation. Gideon. After the death, you know, of Joshua, during the period of Judges, there was no standing office of national leadership. Israel had no king, they had no president, they had no prime minister on earth, only God in heaven. And however, you know, God always takes care of his children. So at the necessary and the appropriate times, God brought forth a leader for the nation. And for the most part, these leaders would rise up to his or her part or job and then return to their own little insignificant places. Now these leaders were not elected. They did not come through royal secession. They were just specially gifted by God for leadership in their time. And the people of God recognized and respected that gifting. Now, in, in, in Judges chapter 6, the Midianites were an oppressive enemy of Israel. And I want you to read this whole book of Judges because there are many, many wonderful lessons to be learned this morning. But this is the one that my heart is pressed on. The Midianites were an oppressive enemy of Israel. And Israel, a small nation, was overruled at that time by God-haters and idol worshipers, and chiefly the Midianites. Now the Bible said that when Israel would plant their barley and their vegetables and the things that would help to sustain their lives, stall their cattle and oxen, sheep and donkeys, and all of their livestock, just about harvest time, the Midianites, hordes of Midianites, would steal everything that they planted. Every time a harvest was before them, the Midianites would come and rob them blind, leave them greatly impoverished and humiliated. So Israel cried to the Lord. You know God sees, he hears, and he knows. The Bible said heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. So in response to Israel's cry, God sends a prophet. Now, now we find Gideon pressing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now, we don't see Gideon, some big, strong man here in character. Many Bible theologians said Midian, that, that Gideon was a coward. A scary coward. Now, not only was it difficult and humiliating to be threshing wheat in the wine press, because you really needed an open space, typically on a hilltop, so that the breeze could blow away the shaft. But this coward, as many say, would be in the wine press so that the Midianites hiding would not see him. But isn't it something how people perceive us to be something? But I'm glad God does not look at us as we see ourselves, or God does not look at us sometimes as other people look at us. 
Listen to Judges, the sixth chapter and the twelfth verse, and hear what God calls Gideon. Judges, the sixth chapter and the twelfth verse said, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now, you know that was a strange greeting to Gideon. First of all, it didn't seem to Gideon like the Lord was with him. And it certainly did not seem like he was some mighty man of valor. Gideon was just an insignificant farmer. Just insignificant. He didn't come from royalty. But I'm glad again that God does not see us as we see ourselves. 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter and the 7th verse says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looketh the outward appearance, but my God looks at the heart. And not only is Gideon afraid, but when God speaks to him, God, Gideon, questions God. Now, this angel of the Lord that we're talking about is just not a regular angel or a regular messenger. But this is a theophany, the Bible said, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, the pre-incarnated Jesus. So Gideon says, and he's really talking to the Lord, Gideon says, if the Lord is with me, then why am I going through and why are we all going through the things in which we are going through? And not only that, God, where are the miracles? Where are the unanswered prayers? Where are the miracles that my father and my ancestors told me about? And if I am so mighty and the mighty man of valor, why am I going through what I'm going through? And how, how did I get here if the Lord is with me? How many of us have asked God those same questions? I have. I still do. Yes, I do. God, if I'm saved and I'm sanctified, then why am I going through all of these things? What do you want me to do? I'm exhausted, but yet in pursuit. You know, I love the Lord. You may notice that the Lord knows us so well. Amen. Psalms 139 said he knows my uprising and my down sitting. He understands my thoughts are far off. There's not a word on my tongue before I speak it that he doesn't know it completely. And last part of that Third verse in Psalms 139 said, He is so acquainted with our ways that God knew Gideon so well that he didn't even negotiate with him. He didn't even explain anything to him. You know, God does us like that sometimes. We throw our hands up. We get frustrated. We holler and scream. And God just laughs. <laughs> I got you. I understand. And the thing that God does not do, he never explains or discusses us to us. He doesn't get in a discuss discussion about you, to you, because it's not your might, 
It's about his might. It's not about your glory. You ain't got none. It's his glory. It's his call on you. Not about your ability or your power or your goal or your gift because you and I don't have no power. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the seventh verse said, For we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. What can you do? Nothing. But the Bible said that I can do all things through the Christ, which what? Strengthens me. I don't have no strength. I don't have no power. He don't have to explain nothing to me. He don't have to negotiate with me. We all like common pottery. We are fragile. We are flawed. And we break easily. But God will use us if we allow him to work through our weaknesses. And I don't know about you, but aren't you glad that God does not hold, withhold and hold our faithless moments against us when we have a pity party and a tantrum? He doesn't hold it against us. He's our Father. And he understands each and every last one of us. He knows his children. And when he lays his hands on you, and when he calls you, and he points you and elects you to do whatever it is he has, guess what? It is forever. You see, the reason why we can't see ourselves as God sees us, because God sees the ending from the beginning. He sees the finished product. He sees what you're going to be or what you are really going to be. That's what he sees. And whatever we achieve, It goes back to God, and he gets the glory. When God called Gideon to service, chapter 6, the 14th through the 16th verse, God said to Gideon, he said, Go this might of yours, and Gideon, guess what? You shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. And I'm certainly... Gideon, a little insignificant farmer who's hiding in the wine press, afraid that the Midianites might find him. <laughs> Go say, Yeah, right. I'm going to save him, all right. <laughs> Has God ever told you to do something? <laughs> and you say, Uh huh. I hear you, God. And we question, how am I going to do that? <laughs> and Gideon said, oh, Lord, I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't understand. You, you must not be talking to me. <laughs> I'm looking for the mighty man of valor. Where is he? Because first of all, God, maybe you don't know this about me, God, but I'm the weakest one in the clan. Manasseh, I'm the least of my father's house. God, do you, maybe you got your tribes mixed up. (laughs) Gideon, God, not Joshua. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you 
and you shall, you Gideon, you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You, I pick you, I chose you from the foundation of this world that you would be holy and blameless before him. I chose you. Go in your might. I know it's hard to see that Gideon, to some people, had anything going for himself. But you know what? God did not mark Gideon. He just said, go in this might of yours, Gideon. And I'm with you. That's the same thing he tells us. I'm with you even until the end. I'm with you. No weapons formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Part of your heritage is a servant of the Lord. My righteousness is in thee, said Lord. Go! I got your back. But you know what? Gideon had a might that he didn't know. Gideon had the might of caring because he cared about the low places of Israel. Let me tell you one thing that God told him to do. He did care about the low places of Israel. You see, we all have to reap what we sow, be accountable for the things that we do. The reason... Nothing just happens. The reason that Israel was having so much problems with the Midianites, because they didn't do what God had told them to do. They had disobeyed God for years and years. And when they finally cried out to the Lord, it was their last resort. He wasn't the first resort. But you know, we all think, some of us, we, we used to think it too, and some of us are still doing it, that we could do anything that we want. Come to the house of prayer on Sundays, be holy and sanctimonious, and still go to heaven. And nobody knows what we're doing in the dark. Some of us are still playing that game. Come on, get real. It is. But God knows, and he sees. And we do things, and we, th we act like God don't see. We act like God doesn't know. And then when something happens to us, then we want to know, oh, I don't understand. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. We can judge everybody else. And we can see the log in everybody else's eye. But we have a problem in looking at ourselves. We do. God allowed the Midianites to come against Israel. Because God knows what it takes to bring us to our knees. Yes, he does. And it's praying time in the nation today. And all that is going on, God knows what it takes to bring us to our knees. Yes, he does. But Gideon had the might of caring. Yes, he did. I'm going to tell you one thing God told him to do. Sometimes when God calls you out, first thing he have you to do is clean up your house. You see, the Israelites was romancing the devil. They had two lovers. You remember that song? I got two lovers. Come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And I'm not ashamed. Come on, quit acting like you wasn't back in the day, because you were. 
Let me tell you about my first lover. He's sweet and kind. They had two lovers, God and Baal. And let me tell you what you can't do. You can't romance the devil. You hear me? You can't love God in the day, in the light, and in the night, romance the devil. Come on now. It don't work. And they were romancing the idol gods of the other people who were surrounded around them. Because first of all, they did not wipe those people out when God told them. You remember? <laughs> they didn't do it. And so you know what? Now it's reaping time. But God told Gideon, said, I want you, Gideon's father, had idol gods. And this is a good test. God said, I want you to go, and I want you to clean up and tear up all those idol gods that your daddy got. Can you, you think you can do that? Gideon said, well, oh God, I don't know now. Because, see, you asking a big thing here now. That's my daddy. So I said, yeah, I know it. I know that's your daddy. <laughs> you, you think you can stand uh, for your daddy to be angry at you, maybe your family? Ah, well, I don't know you're not God. Because, uh, see, you, now I want to serve you, God, but now when you, you get to asking me things here that I, I don't know, God, I got to think about this now. No, because we, we, we want salvation on our terms, you know. <laughs> Come on now. We want it on our terms. Right? We want to do it our way. I said, well, God, you, 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 you think I got to do that? I said, yeah. He said, well, I tell you what, God. What about if I get them old boys and we, we'll go in there at night? I'll go at night when nobody will see me. And, uh clean up them idols. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go at night. Well, he did. <laughs> he did. But you know what? Sometimes we don't want people to know how much we love God in the light. We don't witness sometimes our family members those are hard-pressed people to witness to. And you know it. And you know why sometimes we can't witness to our family members? Because you ain't living the life in front of them. See, first of all, you can't take me where you don't go. You can't tell me what not to do and you're doing if you ain't doing it. We can't tell our children, do as I say, not as I do. If you ain't walking in the path of righteousness. But Gideon obeyed God. He did. And when he removed the idols, oh, they were mad at him now. Yes, they were. So he cared about the low places. And then Gideon had the might of knowledge. And you know why I say that? Because he knew what God had did in the past. Because when he questioned God and he said, where are the miracles? Where are the miracles that my father and my ancestors talked about? And told me about. Where are they God? He knew about God. And then Gideon had the might of the spiritual hunger. He wanted to see God do great works again. He wanted to see those works that he had heard. That God had done. 
and what I love about it. Gideon had a teachable spirit because he listened to what the angel of the Lord say. Some of us have been in the body of Christ so long that we think we've crossed all the I's and the T's. We've read the book yet, the Bible, a couple of times. Some of us know a lot of scripture. I know a lot of scripture. I've been studying this book a long time, and I yet don't know all of it, and I never will. Never will. You just work at it. But you know one thing? The devil don't care how much scripture you know. No way. Who cares? You know what the devil say? You're only a threat to him for the scriptures you apply. A lot of us know scripture, but you ain't standing on it. A lot of us know scripture, but you know one thing? You ain't standing on the promise of God. You ain't living on the promise of God. And you know why? The devil can just do anything to us because you don't open your mouth. Amen. And death and life is in the power of your tongue. You got to fight. Oh, I know you're exhausted. I'm exhausted. But guess what? I'm still pursuing. Gideon had the might of the weak. And God's strength is perfected in our weakness. Don't worry about it. God. God said, when you're weak, I'm strong. Gideon had a might to go forth. He may not understood. He might not could see everything that God wanted him to see. But guess what? He trusted God. God said, I'll be with you. That's all you need to know. You know what? And it's important to know that God has sent all of us. It is important to know that God is with us. We may not be fighting a battle like Gideon, but we are fighting a battle. Oh, yes, we are. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not merely human, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of stronghold, casting down imagination, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are in a war. We fight the battle. Yes, we are. There are many reasons why maybe you think that God shouldn't have called you. But don't worry. We in good company. There is not a disciple in the Bible that did not have an issue. They all had issues. Just as you and I. Every last one of them. And I'm so glad that God doesn't require a job interview for us. I'm glad. I'm glad he doesn't hire and fire like most bosses. You know why? Because he's our Abba Father, not just our boss. He does not look at us and look at financial gain or loss. I'm glad, God. I'm glad that he don't look at us 
the way we look at each other. He's not prejudiced. He's not partial. And as much as we try, I don't care how talented you think you are, you ain't got nothing to do with it. God's gifts are free. They're free. You didn't choose them. You couldn't choose them, Paul said. You don't have nothing to do with it. So you ain't got nothing to boast about. Only thing you could boast about is the goodness of God. The devil looks back at our past. But I'm so glad God looks at the cross. When God looks at the cross, it says, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I just thank God that Gideon never let go of his mission. Sometimes we get tired along the way. But don't get tired in well-doing. Don't faint. It's no time to have a pity party. It's not. It's no time to get slack. We got to fight to the finish line. I believe in my heart that Gideon heard God telling him to keep going. You got to fight for your children. Fight for your city. Fight for the nation. The victory is yours. God said, I'm just calling you to trust me. That's all you need to do. Whatever battle you are facing today, and we are facing many, God is saying the same words to you that he said to Gideon. I don't care how big the enemy may look, how outnumbered it may seem. I'm going to give you something that the enemy doesn't have. I'm going to give you Jesus. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you may ask or think according to the power that walketh in you. According to Ephesians 3 and 20. You got something the devil don't have. Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter and the 15th verse said, Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. The battle, whatever it is you're going through, it may be sickness, it may be financial, it may be your children, it may be relationships, it may be your job. I don't care what it looks like in the natural. God said, because the battle is not yours. The battle is of the Lord's. And all the strength you need to finish the battle is in God's hand. We have to get on our knees. Pray for whatever he calls us to do. And I promise you, he will supply all your strength to accomplish anything that you need to do. God would never have you to do something that his grace doesn't carry you. God's miracles, his miraculous triumph is in the people that he's chosen. Today, I want you to take one thing away from here. Boast in one, this one thing alone. The battle is not mine. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. He has shown us he is the source of all life, the source of all power, the source of all victory. And we give him glory knowing that he can draw and will draw all men unto him. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, I think God has spoken. Amen. No need for me to say anything other than what has God spoken to you as this message came forth. Um, he may want you to com totally commit your life to Christ. Sometimes when we first come to the Lord, we, we say, well, I give my life to the Lord. But then as we walk along, God shows us, yeah, I got half your life, but I want all of it. <laughs> Does God have all your life? You're the only one that can uh, answer that. So I'm putting this out to you that you might make that total commitment to Jesus Christ. You're not going to be saved by your works. You're not going to be saved by anything that you do. Christ paid the price on the cross he bore your sins that you might be free from them and that you might be able to receive his righteousness. You know where you're at in God.